Friend. So it is Friday, October 16th, 2020. And I wanted to let people know, uh, people have been, we're still getting people inquiring about advertising with the African History Network and on the African History Network show. And uh, now that I'm on uh, through Friday, I want to let you all know that you can now advertise um, with the African History Network uh, during uh, on our with the African History Network show on our weekly show. Okay, so uh, email us at customer service at African History Network dot com, customer service at African History Network dot com, um, African American business owners. Uh, who want to advertise your business you may have an e-commerce store you may have a brick and mortar store um, whatever type of business you're in whether it's health and beauty products whether you are an author whether you, you sell books uh, whether you have a school or you deal with education you can advertise with the African History Network so what we do we take you um, we create a video commercial for you and you may have seen uh, in some of the rebroadcasts of um, you may have seen some of the rebroadcasts of our shows you see the new video commercials okay most of those I created I do the voiceover and uh, you can send me a script we put together that 30 second to 60 second video commercial and then when we re-air the uh, uh, shows we air them throughout the week uh, people see your commercial this helps promote you also upload the video commercial to our fan page the African History Network and then also on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. All right, African-American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast also. And uh, email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And uh, we'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. We can get you up and running uh, today. So, we, uh, you, so you'll get the video commercial and then also our... Uh, our broadcasts are in audio podcast format as well. So you're on, uh, we're on nine different audio podcast platforms. We're on Blog Talk Radio, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, CastBox, Acast, uh, TuneIn. So when people listen to the audio podcast of these broadcasts, they'll hear your audio commercial as well. Okay, so you may have an upcoming conference or a virtual conference. I know, you know, I usually speak. Uh, out of state uh, once a once a month or something like that. All that's been basically canceled. But people are having virtual conferences. You may have a virtual conference that you want to promote. You may have a restaurant, catering business. Uh, you may sell African jewelry, African uh, clothing, African garb, etc. T-shirt company. Email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. Now a lot um, a lot of people um, oftentimes say, well. When we look at other uh, ethnic groups and, and races of people, we look at Arabs and, and Chaldeans and things like this, you know, they have a, uh, and Asians, they have a history of entrepreneurship, okay? Well, when we study uh, our history, uh, African people, we have a history of entrepreneurship as well. And when we look at the first economies, when we look at um, the uh, great African civilizations that we love to talk about, whether we talk about ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt, uh, whether we talk about uh, Ta-Nehisi or Nubia uh, or ta uh if we talk about Ethiopia or Abyssinia, we talk about Great Zimbabwe, things like this. We go into West Africa and we deal with Ghana, Songhai, and Mali. When we deal with these great African nations in, 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 in these societies, we're going to see that they have uh, some type of economic system. We're going to see they're engaging in commerce. They're engaging in trade. They usually have uh, some type of African market. Okay, And uh, we see that they're going to have control of land. They're, if they are involved in agriculture, they're growing their own food. They're not relying upon Asians and Arabs and Chaldeans to feed them. Okay, they may engage in commerce and trade with other ethnic groups, other races of people, but they have control of land. They uh, are engaged in agriculture. They have mineral wealth. There, there's an economy, and there's some type of government system there's some type of structure as well when we look at these great african societies we see this so in all actuality we know that african people are the first farmers we're the first entrepreneurs as well that's in our history but even in this country we have a deep rich history of 
of entrepreneurship. We have the co-ops, the cooperatives. Uh, Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard is the author of the book uh, Collective Courage. Collective Courage. And Gordon Nemhard's book Collective Courage. And Collective Courage deals with a history of African American cooperative thought and practice. A history of African American cooperative thought and practice. And I interviewed the sister back in about 2000. 14, I think it was, two, well, maybe it was about 2016 I interviewed her. Um, and she was speaking here in Detroit. So I interviewed her to help promote the lecture. And her book deals with the deep, rich history of cooperative economics, the co-ops. And the co-ops, uh, the cooperatives, th is, those are uh, African principles we brought with us from West Africa. And with... Uh, with these cooperatives, like whether it's, whether it's the Colored Merchants Association, whether it's things like the uh, Colored Farmers National Alliance and Cooperative Unions, th th these are ways that African Americans engaged in economic empowerment, engaged in business, engaged in economics. And it's a collective. The members were owners of the, um, of the organization or of the uh, business or something like that as opposed to maybe just individual owners or maybe just a family owning a business you had a collective and you could compete better you could the the, uh, the owners uh, shared in the profits it was more beneficial as opposed to the capitalism that we're taught or it gets dressed up as uh, black capitalism etc and and what happened was um, a lot of African Americans went to white business schools or they went to uh, uh, business schools at HBCUs that taught white business principles and we then brought those white business principles back to the African American community okay and, and tried to use them and for the most part unity in a work they may work for your family they may work for you individually but the cooperatives were different. So when we look at things like the Colored Merchants Association, right? The Colored Merchants Association was created uh, right around 1928, 1929. It comes out of the National Negro Business League. And this was an association of African-American grocery store owners so, so that they could work together, pool their resources together, learn marketing uh, uh, tactics, learn better accounting principles, uh, Buy it buy in bulk so they get a lower economies of scale and better economies of scale and they could better compete against the the chain stores the growing number of chain stores the Kresge's and the Woolworths and a and things like this this is the colored merchants association that comes out of the National Negro Business League and that National Negro Business League was um, uh, founded by uh, Booker T Washington okay right around 1900. All right, so we have a we have a deep rich history of these co-ops when we look at things like the uh, the Colored Farmers National Alliance and Cooperative Union. This was founded in 1886 in Texas. Okay, 1886 in Texas. It only lasts five years, but they grow to about 1.2 million members. Okay, now a lot of people haven't heard about this because when oftentimes when we deal with this history. The cooperatives, the co-ops are left out. We have things like the Free African Society of 1787. We're going to have, uh, even when we go back to slavery, we're going to have uh, many cooperatives that are helping buy people out of slavery, helping pay for burial costs, etc. You know, we were doing uh, crowdfunding before it was called crowdfunding. This is all in our history. These are all principles. So when, when you hear me talk about Dr. Leonard Jeffries and Professor James Small, two of my teachers, and when they teach, they talk about the pyramid principle. And we look at the three sides of the pyramid. The foundation is African history and culture. And it's African history and culture that gives us our VIPs, our values, our interests, and our principles. And this gives us a cultural paradigm that we see reality through. And then uh, this helps define reality for us. And then the, uh, the two sides of the pyramid are economic empowerment and political empowerment. Well, your history and culture influences how you engage into those economics, 
Okay, are you dealing with uh, economic empowerment, engaging in economics from a cultural perspective, or are you dealing with it from a perspective that has been imposed upon you? Yes, we deal, Yes, we live in a capitalistic society, but how do we engage in that capital, capitalistic society? So when we look at the uh, Colored Farmers National Alliance and Cooperative, um, they were formed in 1886 in Texas, despite the fact that both, both African American and white farmers faced great difficulties due to the rise, uh, due to the to, due to the rising price of farming and the decreasing profits that were coming from farming. The protective that the protective organization known as the Southern Farmers Alliance did not allow African American farmers to join. So a, a, a group of African-American farmers decided to organize their own alliance to fill their need. The, C, uh, the CFACU, Colored Farmers National Alliance and Cooperative Union, operated under fear and harassment by white farmers, but managed to operate several cooperatives in the late 19th century before having to disband. They were getting threats. They were getting death threats. Okay. So they had to they had to disband. When you research this, you're going to see a lot of these cooperatives, they they got attacked, some people were beaten up, killed, so they're gonna to have to disband to save their lives. Members of the CFACU shared agricultural techniques and innovations and coordinated cooperative efforts for planting and harvesting. The union promoted alliances between farmers and laborers and was active in local and regional politics in order to maintain rights for African Americans after Reconstruction. So Reconstruction is 1865 to 1877. It's estimated that the CFACU had 1.2 million members and was the largest black organization of its time. Okay, uh, you know, and when we look at different African principles, um, uh, when we look at cooperatives, for instance, Motown started Motown with $800 that he borrowed from his family's co-op in 1959. His family had a cooperative. He borrows money from the cooperative to start Motown Records. When we look at the uh, Susu system, okay? Now, it's not the, I ain't talking about the Susu that's floating around now in the city. I'm just talking about traditionally. It's not an endorsement of stuff floating around now. But in parts of West Africa and the Caribbean, an, an ancient of cooperative economics exists called SUSU. As one of the oldest forms of microfinance in Africa, the practice is run by one of Africa's oldest financial groups, SUSU collectors. They run their business from Kiosk Marketplace and act as mobile bankers. Clients make low but regular deposits on a daily or weekly basis over the course of a month into a SUSU account. At the end of this period, the SUSU collector returns the accumulated savings to the client but keeps one day's savings as commission. SUSU collectors may also provide advances to their clients or rotate the accumulated deposits of a group but to members. Today, SUSU collectors provide many West Africans who would otherwise be denied credit with access to money. They need to start up small venture projects that in many cases benefit the community as a whole. In the United States, black immigrants from the Caribbean have enjoyed one of the highest economic growth rates using a form of the SUSU and leveraging this practice to establish successful credit unions. So when we look at credit unions, Credit unions are one of the uh, most well-known forms of a cooperative because when uh, you belong to a credit union member as opposed to a bank, you are a member, okay? So you, 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 you uh, as opposed to just somebody who has an account with the uh, credit union, uh, as opposed to somebody who has uh, an account with a bank, with a credit union, you are actually a member, okay? So it's different. That a credit union is a form of a cooperative as well. Um, AtlantaBlackStar.com has a good article from uh, 2013, Five Historic Examples of Cooperative Economics, Ujima, that advanced the black community. And then also check out this book here, 
Collective Courage, A History of African-American Cooperative Economic Thought and Practice from Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard. Okay, so check your local African-American business, uh, uh, local African-American bookstore uh, for that book. But oftentimes when I hear, and not my degrees in business administration with a major in marketing from Wayne State University here in Detroit, a lot of times uh you know when i business consulting for seven years i managed african-american companies we had contracts with uh, uh city of detroit county of wayne state of michigan and in teaching entrepreneurship a lot of times people don't know a lot of times african-americans don't know our deep rich history in economic empowerment entrepreneurship and principles we brought with us from africa here as well but don't even understand what we were actually doing during slavery okay and then during reconstruction so we have a deep, a deep, rich history of this. So once again, um, you can email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, customer service.com, African American business owners. Uh, you can advertise with the African History Network uh, on the African History Network show. We're on Monday through Fridays uh, now. And then what we do, we take your... Um, uh, 30 second to 60 second video commercial and I'll create a video commercial for you so when you see some of the rebroadcasts of our shows you see the video commercials in there uh, Black History uh, uh, Mobile Museum 101 is, is one of them a lot of those video commercials I'm the one that puts them together I do the voiceover you send me a script we put that together and then when we re-air these broadcasts you see those commercials in there and then also in the audio podcast format of our broadcast we have your audio commercial in there as well. Okay, so we're on nine different audio podcast platforms, iHeartRadio, uh, FM Player, TuneIn, uh, iTunes, uh, Blog Talk Radio. So if you are an uh, African-American book author, if you uh, have a bookstore, whether you have a brick-and-mortar store or an e-commerce store, if you sell health and beauty products, uh, clothing, African garb, or weather, regular clothing, um, if you sell athletic gear, shoes okay um you have a fitness website if you have an upcoming conference or event virtual conference etc we can uh, help you market that at the african history network email us at customer service at african history network.com customer service at african history network.com also follow us on our facebook fan page the african history network the african history network and uh, turn on notifications so you know when we go live Follow us on our uh, YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P, on YouTube as well. And um, check out this information dealing with um, the cooperatives, but also understanding our history when it comes to entrepreneurship and economic empowerment. That's always been part of the uh, of our movements, okay? Whether we talk about Marcus Garvey, even when we talk about the Civil Rights Movement. That is, the, the cooperatives were part of the Civil Rights Movement. It just, it's just not talked about a lot when they retell the story. They, 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 you know, oftentimes they just talk about marching and sitting in and different things like this. But there's, there was an economic component to the Civil Rights Movement um, as well. And actually, if you look at the... Um, uh, if you look at this article from Vox.com, uh, sorry, V-I-C-E, Vice.com, how black co-ops can fight institutional racism, how black co-ops can fight institutional racism. It's an interview with Dr. Jessica Gordon Nimhar, and on page six of the um, page six of the article, uh, the question was asked by the interviewer, "What role has cooperative economics played in black communities in the U.S.?" And she responded, African Americans have engaged in some form of collective economics throughout our, throughout our entire history in America. Sometimes it was tilling kitchen gardens on Sundays when we weren't working as enslaved people and sharing the produce. Sometimes it was putting in dues to bury loved ones. By the 1700s and 1800s, we had more formalized, more formalized systems of collective uh, economics that were more enterprise driven, like insurance companies and collective farming. Eventually, we had collective grocery stores, like, like going back to the um, uh, Color Merchants Association in 1928-1929, okay? It was a, 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 a cooperative of African American grocery store owners. Eventually, we had collective grocery stores, credit unions, and health care. 
Europeans eventually recognized the model around 1844 and it formally came to the U.S. African Americans then started forming official co-ops in the 1860s and 1870s. Okay, so Civil Wars 1861-1865, 13th Amendment is ratified December 6, 1865, 1865-1877, you have this period of time called Reconstruction, when they're putting the Union back together, rebuilding them. Rebuilding the South that was devastated because of the Civil War, and then we have the 14th Amendment, where well, we had the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which is giving rights to African Americans. Uh, the 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 this, uh, 14th Amendment of 1868, which gives citizenship. The 15th Amendment of 1870, which guarantees the right to vote to African American men, not women, but African American men. Okay, so you have this period of time. You have the um, the um, the Force Acts, F-O-R-C-E, the Force Acts of the 1870s, like the like the uh, Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, which is a a, a federal law that is um, a rec that is designed to really attack the Klan. Okay, and uh, this the the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871. So you have all this taking place. You have African Americans um, uh, owning land, acquiring land. You have uh, us uh, winning seats in, in Congress, the U most of them in the House of Representatives. Uh, you're going to have two in the Senate, okay, U.S. Senate. So all this is taking place during uh, Reconstruction. So by the 1880s, labor unions were actually helping workers to start their own co-ops, and African Americans were involved uh, in that too. So they were asked the question, she was asked the question, uh, did it play a, did co-ops play a role in the civil rights movement? She said it, it, it was what I call a silent partner, a silent partner to the movement. This was done by, she said this was done by blacks. Um, yeah, so it's going to be a silent partner in the movement, okay? Um, uh, the the co-ops. Okay, so check out the rest of this article here, and we know that we know that um, economic boycotts were part of the civil rights movement. But you're also going to have a component where you have co-ops helping raise money for the civil rights movement, and you have African American businesses, etc. You people have like you have people like A. G. Gaston, um, who was a uh, 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 life insurance titan business owner you're going to have him uh, putting up money to bail civil rights workers uh, out of jail all different types of things like this are going to take place so oftentimes when the stories get retold uh, these different aspects uh, are left out of it the economic component but another aspect is, is left out is the uh, the armed resistance the armed self-defense when it comes to the civil rights movement as well. So that's why that's why this book here is so important and also the book by uh, the, also the book uh, uh, The Deacons for Defense. But that's why this book right here by Professor Charles E. Cobb Jr. is so important. Uh, this nonviolent stuff that gets you killed. How guns made the civil rights movement possible. Because this talks about how it was if it had not been for Negroes with guns, there would not have been a civil rights movement because it was Negroes with guns. It was African Americans with guns who were protecting the civil rights workers while they're engaging in that nonviolent uh, direct action. OK. And when I interviewed uh, Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries back in about June or July. OK. And he's a nephew of Dr. Leonard Jeffries. He's an associate professor of uh, history at Ohio State University. We talked about. Um, uh, John Lewis passing and, and Bill Clinton's comments about uh, Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael, and John Lewis' funeral. So we got deep into this history. And you do, we did with the Black Power Movement coming out of SNCC in 1966, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, and uh, Kwame, Ture, Kwame Ture went in the, ch uh, the chairmanship of SNCC, John Lewis leaving, others uh, leaving who are not with the Black Power Movement. But we deal, dealt with how you had armed, uh, you had African Americans with guns protecting the civil rights movement, uh, even before uh, the Deacons for Defense and Justice is founded in 1964. 
I mean, we go back and look at uh, Dr. King. Dr. King owned guns until Bayard Rustin convinced him to get rid of his guns. But in 1956, Dr. King tries to get a concealed pistol license in Montgomery, Alabama, because he's getting death threats during the Montgomery bus boycott. Okay, so when uh, Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard was asked, uh, "Did it play a role in the civil rights movement?" she said, "It it it was what I call a silent partner to the movie, to the movement." This was done by blacks partly to survive outside of U.S. capitalism, which was so exploitive. It was also independence and wealth so we could be more politically active. Okay, so we have a deep, rich history of this. So this is what we have to tap into. This is why uh, our, our history and culture is so important. A people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. Okay? This is why this is so important. Okay, so once again, email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. I didn't mean to go on so long, but I'm a teacher as well. For 25 years, the Black History 101 Mobile Museum has carried on the rich legacy of the Black Museum movement in America by showcasing original artifacts of the Black experience at colleges, universities, K-12 schools, corporations, libraries, conferences, and cultural events, making it the most traversed black history mobile exhibit in American history. Dr. Khalid El Hakim is the founder of the Black History 101 Mobile Museum, and he is a highly sought after public speaker on topics of black history, social studies, education, museum studies, hip hop, and race relations. Dr. Khalid was named among the change makers for NBC Universal's Erase the Hate campaign and listed as one of the 100 men of distinction for black enterprise. He recently founded the Michigan Hip Hop Archive on the campus of Western Michigan University. The Black History 101 Mobile Museum is currently scheduling in-person and virtual exhibits nationwide. For more information, please contact Dr. Khalid Al-Hakim directly at 313-645-4197, 313-645-4197, or visit their website at blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. That's blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. You can also email him at bhistory101 at yahoo.com, bhistory101 at yahoo.com. Yaya Rule is a line of African print inspired apparel catered to the black community. The pieces include t-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, jackets, dresses, skirts, activewear, bags, and other accessories and home decor. This brand offers a revived way for men and women to wear their black pride and honor their African heritage anywhere at any time. This apparel line is for anyone whether you are working in the corporate world, are an entrepreneur, or an artist, their selection will allow you to casually let your pride shine or dress it up as wanted. It is for those who have already embraced African fabrics and for those who are just getting introduced to them. Reclaim and experience a part of our culture with rich and colorful African prints. The clothing line and the accessories are available right now starting at $17.99. For more information on the new items and accessories, visit yayarule.com. Uh, email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com, customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. Uh, post the name of your, of your African American owned business here. We've got uh, shops or be glam. Okay, shops or be glam.com. Uh, that's Lanisha. Uh, we've got, uh, let's see here, what, what, what we have here. Um, we've got, um, okay, we've got Patrick, Tomiko, um, okay, we've got Joe. Yeah, email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay, uh, we've got, uh, who else we have here? I'm looking at the names of some of your businesses. Uh, Anna asks, how can she get the book, uh, Collective Courage? Yeah, check with your local African-American bookstore or uh, Amazon. It should be at Amazon. Um, 
womboomman.com, uh, Mansa, uh, Rubicon Restaurant, Rubicon Smoked Potatoes, Rub uh, Rubicon Restaurant, Tulsa.com. You're in Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's where Black Wall Street was. Tulsa was founded by Creek Indians around 1836. The Creek Indians, the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole Indians got pushed off their land in the southeastern United States areas like Georgia and Alabama because of the Indian Removal Act of 1830 signed into law by President uh, Andrew Jackson, which is uh, the favorite president of this um, first Russian president of the United States, Donald John Trump. And they go over a thousand miles on the Trail of Tears and they take their African slaves with them. The Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole Indians all owned African slaves. Now, as Professor James Small, one of my teachers, pointed out to me, he said the Red Red Tail Creek Indians did not own slaves. But you're going to have some of them that own, you know, these different nations that own African slaves as well. Um, so when they go into Oklahoma, they take their African slaves with them. And uh, Tulsa comes from the Creek, the Creek Indian word Talasi. Talasi. This is where the word Tulsa comes from. So you're going to at the, uh, the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole Indians derisively, pejoratively called the five civilized tribes of Native Americans because they adopted Christianity, learned to speak English, and, and uh, owned slaves. Um, they're all going to fight on behalf of the South during the Civil War. They all fight on behalf of the Confederacy during the Civil War because they... Um, on slaves, okay? Now, um, you're going to have these Africans who marry into these various Native American nations, get uh, citizenship rights, things like this. This is going to happen. Uh, a lot of us have some type of Native American ancestry. I'm one of them. I have Cherokee and Blackfoot on my mother's side of the family because my mother's from Tennessee. Um, so, What's going to happen is you're going to have the Black Freedom and Indian Treaties of 1866. And this is, uh, this is, so, uh, back up for a quick minute and then we're going to end this. When these Native American nations take up arms against the Union during the Civil War, they violate treaties that they have with the, with the United States. And these treaties stipulate that they can never take up arms against the Union. So before uh, the Civil War, you're going to have um, these uh, uh, Native American territories where they own this land, where they have this land. Th that land is going to be taken back after the Civil War ends and they're going to be put on reservations. But uh, there are also stipulations that they have to free their slaves. Some of them don't free their slaves until like 1866, 1867. Because they did, you know, invoke said, give it up, turn it loose. They didn't want to give it up or turn it loose some of them. Now, this, this is not, I'm not saying that we should hate Native Americans. That's not what I'm saying. I'm dealing with their history. I don't, I don't want people to misunderstand what I'm saying because Native, many of us have Native American blood. Many of us, um, there are black Indians that exist today. There are black Indians. And we saw that the Cherokee stripped the black freedmen in 2011 of their citizenship rights in the Cherokee Nation and those black freedmen are going to sue to get their citizenship rights back in the Cherokee Nation, get their full rights, etc. Okay? So there, there are about 566 or 567 federally recognized tribal nations in this country. Okay? So I, I, don't, I don't want us to um, I don't want us to look at all of them negatively or attack them, things like this. Because, see, um, white supremacy pits groups of oppressed people against each other to fight one another. The U.S. has violated over 371 peace treaties with Native Americans. And um, oftentimes you're dealing, when, when you deal with different ethnic groups or what have you, races, what have you that are fighting one another, usually they're operating based upon misinformation that's been fed to them coming out of white supremacy. All right, so this is, so we have to, we have to understand that also. Um, but if, when you read 
books like The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence, and I just had Dr. David M. Hotep on my show uh, Monday, October 12th for Indigenous Peoples Day, Columbus Day, all right? The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence, which deals with the African presence in the Americas, going back at least 56,000 years ago in South America, but in the land we call the United States of America, United States of America going back at least 51,700 years ago. Okay, the Khoisan, uh, who come from southern Africa, the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa, they were here going, going back at least 51,700 years ago before Native Americans, the people who we call Native Americans, came into existence. The people who we call Native Americans are the offspring in general, the offspring of the intermixing between Africans who were already here and Asians who come here around um, 3000 BC, okay, about 5,000 years ago. They intermix and their offspring are, in general, who we call Native Americans. If you look at old black and white photographs of uh, Native Americans, and this is why I can't do these uh, broadcasts like this and only do five minutes, because, uh, <laughs> uh, where's that book? Uh, this book right here. So if you look at old black and white uh, photographs of Native Americans, this is Chronology of Native Americans, The Ultimate Guide to North America's indigenous people, right? When you look at old black and white photographs of Native Americans, these were not like, these were not a very light-skinned, almost white-looking people, like a lot of Native Americans you see today. No, not an, not an attack on them. I'm just explaining this. These were usually a dark-skinned people, oftentimes with high cheekbones. And what's going to happen, you have those who are the offspring of an intermixing of Africans and Asians, one. Two, when European settlers come here, uh, a lot of the African groups that are already here, a lot of them get reclassified as Native Americans. Okay? So you have to really understand this chronology of history. Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay, who's one of the baddest scholars who deals with uh, the history of the Moors, teaches about the history of the Moors. He used to teach classes at um, Temple University in Philadelphia. The last I heard, he's at Berea College in Kentucky. Okay, Berea College, incidentally, is uh, where Dr. Carter G. Woodson, co-founder of the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, September 9th, 1915, and founder of Negro History Week in 1926, Berea College is where Dr. Carter G. Woodson got his uh, undergraduate degree. All right, this is a little black history fact, African American history fact. But, so we have to understand this chronology of history. Now, in all of this history, this does not mean the transatlantic slave trade did not happen. It does not mean August 20th, 1619 did not happen when those 29 Africans on the White Lion pirate ship are traded for food and, and water and supplies. That does not mean that did not happen. That does not mean 1526 did not happen when the Spanish had taken Africans into the territory, the area we call South Carolina and Georgia. And those and they're enslaving them. Those Africans are going to overthrow their oppressors and they're going to disappear, run, run away uh, to join Native Americans. That doesn't mean 1526 did not happen. That does not mean 1513 did not happen when a West African uh, born in West Africa around 1480 named Juan Garrido comes into Florida with Juan Ponce de Leon, the Spanish conquistador. He was African. He that's, that's probably the first person of African descent that we know of by name. Okay, Even Dr. Henry Louis Skip the Truth Gates talks about Juan Garrido. Uh, he talks about Juan Garrido in Rich Gates' book. Um, you got to bear with me. Okay, so I got like five stacks of articles in file folders to my left and I got seven stacks of books to my right so you just gotta bear with me but um, in Gates book of African Americans Many Rivers to Cross um, he talks about Ron Garrido okay in the um, I'll show it to you this book right here Actually, two books. Okay, so the African Americans, Many Rivers to Cross. In 2012, Gates did this, I think, a six-part series on PBS. This is the companion book to that PBS series, okay? Um, and he talks about Juan Garrido in here. It's page, I think it's in the introduction. And just bear with me. I really did not plan to be on this long. I got a lot of work to do. Um... 
page four. Page four. He's showing Juan Garrido and Juan Ponce de Leon. Okay. So, and then also in Gates' book, 100 Amazing Facts About the Negro. And Gates does do some good research. Now, there's some flaws when he talks about African involvement in the transatlantic slave trade. But I give, I've read dozens of Gates articles. He does do some good research. Ancient African history is not his forte, though, you know. Uh, so, but this one right here, he talks about Juan Garrido in here as well. 100 amazing facts about the Negro. So, we have to understand the, the history we have to understand it chronologically. We have to understand it chronologically. Okay. Um, African people migrate at different times for different reasons. It could be voluntarily, it could be forced, etc. So just because um, African people were here for tens of thousands of years, that doesn't mean a forced, uh, that doesn't mean we weren't brought here as captives also. You have to understand the chronology of like the last 50,000 years of history as opposed to just the last 500 years of history. All right. Okay. So um, uh, that's going to be it now. Okay. <laughs> uh, also, if you like this topic of information, you can donate to the African History Network. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Finance the research helps us. Uh, keep doing our Sunday night show. We're still on Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WF, WFDF in Detroit. Now we're on uh, Monday through Friday also, 11 p.m. to midnight as well. So now uh, I'm doing six days of radio a week. Okay, I'm doing six days of broadcast a week. All right, so email us, customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, we'll get you up and running right away. And all, oh, the other thing is, if there's a situation where you say, well, look, I want to take advantage of this, because we have limited, um, we have limited uh, inventory, a limited space. If there's a situation where you say, okay, well, look, I want to take advantage of this uh, to lock in my, space, my ad space, but I, I, I won't be ready to advertise for a month or I won't be ready to advertise until December or something like that. That's fine also. It's still email us. We'll get you locked in. All right. Okay. So remember at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Right now.